Hello, everyone. This is Shane Gibson, and welcome to the Digital Rebar Provision number 32 meetup, the first of 2019. We managed to close out 32 in the previous year and, and more, and here we are today, um, ringing in the new year. A few, few weeks late, but our first meetup for the year. Uh, we have a fair bit on deck for you today. We've got some discussions around the pooling plugin, uh, Sledgehammer Builder, and licensing updates. If we get some time after that, we'll try and uh, uh, pull, up, pull off a little bit of bug scrubbing and try and clean things up to go into 2019. Uh, in the meantime, uh, we're going to kick this off with pooling plugin. Uh, Rob, you want to you guys want to talk about pooling plugin? I would defer to Greg on that one. Well, I'm trying to get my system back functional. Cool. That's a good good idea. Should we uh, cover licensing stuff right now and let you give you that 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 I can talk about uh, very happily. Um, so the boy, uh, Racken's been building a whole bunch of. Um, plugins and extensions for rebar that focus on a lot of it's on production uh, concerns like pooling plugin is, is a production concern, image deployments, firmware, um, IPMI, uh, there's a whole bunch more stuff coming, uh, tower, the tower integrations, things like that. Um, but what we realize is that a lot of that we want people to be able to try them and play with them. And in some cases, uh, if you're in a small environment, just use them. And so we uh, are in the process of making it just all those all those things more accessible. So today, uh, you've had to people have had to ask for us to create an org for them, and then in the org authorize modules on a on a sort of a name by name basis, uh, and then you'd have to generate a license, and and that would allow you to then use those specific modules. It, and we still have that licensing model. It's it's what we use from a commercial perspective. Uh, but we added a um, just a general node count, you know, you can use anything license uh, type into the system. And so in that license, it's uh, what, what we call up to nodes. And so that those allow uh, anybody, right? What, what we did is we changed the UX so that if you have a regular user account, you can um, click the create license uh, button, and then uh, that will generate one of these up to licenses. Uh, they start at 10 machines, uh, and they create a 90 day license. So you can use uh, the plugins in the rack end uh, catalog, uh, the ones that we have in, in the sort of public library uh, for uh, you know, up to 10 notes. So once you've created that license, you can download and install those plugins and go to town. Um, and the licenses are 90 day licenses. And after 60 days, you can auto, you can just click the button and renew them. Uh, so we're, we're trying, and then the reason we haven't done this as a big launch is because we still, there's a fair bit of documentation gaps. Some of the advanced functionality like the image deployers, um, but we do want to be able to make image deploy more generally accessible. And this is, this is the way we're, we're starting that. So people can play it, with it and try it, things like that. Um, they add another note around the licenses from that perspective. Oh yeah. And the way the licenses work is they're actually, and this is worth noting they're they're in the endpoints. So our licenses are actually a, um, signed key, uh, that's, that's stored in the endpoint. So when you click the create license button, it's actually building a profile in the system. I, I've recorded a video that explains all this. It's, it's uh, and there's some, there's some docs in the system about it too. Uh, and what happens is that, that we're actually creating a profile that stores that key and then the plugins will reference that key uh, to make it work. So the nice thing about that is that means you're not, you don't have to log into the UX. Um, you don't have to be, you're, you're never connected. You're not in any, anyway, you're not connected to uh, any rack end, back end stuff. It's all one time you'll generate the license and then you've, you've got it working. Um, and so that'll enable, that enables you to, to, you know, basically play. 
It's a good thing. It's a lot of cool stuff that we've been building that people have been like, I didn't even know that was there. And then also uh, along with the licensing, some of the advanced content pieces coming from the rack end side are, um, some are fairly easy and self-explanatory to use and some are a lot more involved and require um, a fair bit of setup. And so coupled with the licensing stuff is documentation which um, I know Racken has been working on some, but I suspect there are still modules that haven't been fully updated with documentation. So there's still going to be a little bit of lag on use case scenarios with some of the more advanced things until uh, more uh, detailed documentation and information gets out there in the standard uh, read the docs repo. Mm -hmm. Yeah, you'll see that come through and then there'll be some things where we'll do, we'll do videos or trainings. For image deployment, the uh, the if we create an image like a CentOS image that you can do as an image deploy uh, and then make that available, that's a pretty straightforward. It's really easy at that point to use the image, the imaging stuff. Uh, building your own image is, is is a lot harder, and so we're going to either have to write documentation or decide that that's a services engagement. Um, could be a little bit of both. Uh, uh, we'll need some more hands-on experience. Uh, most of, it only takes usually a day, so but everybody has their you know their image is unique, so it's not necessarily something that you can say click here, click here, click here. It, it ends up being you have to know what you're doing, and it'll be easier once we get the um, icon pieces out. So. That's for that. Oh, and then the final thing I would say is that this is, you know, we're, we're I, I sort of think we're in beta, think of us as being in beta for this because there's a couple other changes that are being rolled in on the licensing perspective. Um, as we're, as we're tweak, as we're, we're interacting with customers and tuning that. So um, please, please play with it. Let us know if you have trouble ask because it's possible that um, we made a, a tweak and it changed something. Uh, I'll, I'll finish, that, finish that line chain. We can we can move that up. This was a feature request. And I can talk about that in, in, if, if Greg's not ready. Uh, I won't be. Okay. There's some, something wrong with our my setup right now. Ah, okay. So not much is working across the board. Okay. I mean, I can talk about it, what we've done. Just can't show it. Fighting licensing and other issues. Do you, do you wanna, you wanna walk through the, you want, you want to take the conk on this one or do you want me to talk about the feature request thing? Good, I mean, just keep going on the feature request thing. It's not okay. All right, so um, we had a feature request, uh, not quick enough with names to, actually, it was Ronalds? Yeah, he was asking. Um, so th this is a really reasonable request, although it, it, it filters back against how we, how we develop. So, and so hold, I, hold on, Ron. Yeah. Can you um, level set us here on what the actual feature request is? <laughs> or what the is that he was after? Thank you. Ah, uh, so the, the feature request is to hide um, locked content, which shows up in the UX is locked with what the objects think of as read only content, um, is to be able to hide, hide the, the locked content. Um, so in this, this is, I've, I've had this experience. So if you're doing development in the UX, and cloning, so, uh, and it's to show only cloned would be the way they, it was described, show only cloned. Um, yeah, rewrite cloned objects. Um, so this is, this, in, so in the UX, uh, you know, 90%, 90 plus percent of the content is this read only content, which you, you can't change but you do use to build things. And so there were, there's two places where this request comes in. One is on the basic list views um, so that the lists are, are less um, overwhelming. And then the other place is it's on the pull downs so that the pull downs are potentially less overwhelming. Um, and uh, yeah, 
So that that's does that does the request make sense? It it, it declutters the UX considerably. Yep. If you if yep. you do that, um, it does. So, um, what's your feedback on all of this? Um, the let me do the pull downs because that's easier. Um, for the pull downs, it really gets ugly to try and filter them, because if you start emitting things from the pull downs, then um, do you, do you have a web UX uh, UX session up that you can yeah uh, I do at least just point us through as you walk through this you want to take over the share um, yeah I'll do that just let me, let me get it logged in and then I'll happily do that um, uh, did I resolve this cool all right I'm just I'm just making it smaller so it's easier to see. Can people see that? Yep. Yay. Um, okay, so uh, the example for the pull downs would be like, in, in this case, these are workflows. Workflows are, all, are mostly read only right now, but stages aren't. So in this case, all <laughs> for me, all of my stages are read only stages. Um, so if you start say if I, if I, so if I created like a, a global button that said, show me read only stages or not, then um, if I only showed read write, then there's a whole bunch of places in the UX um, where that would be really confusing. Uh, let's see if I got to log in. Ah. So what would happen is if I was only showing the read only read only pieces, um, this list would be a lot shorter, which considering how long it's gotten is, is a good thing. Um, but if I was in a stage over here that was read only, then it's gonna be confusing because now I'm missing a stage over here. Does that make sense? In the, yeah, in the pull down it'd be missing. And so um, that, this, that's my concern. So if I drop into a machine, say, um, and I go into edit mode here, I, have this, I start having the same problem, right? It's, it's, you can limit a lot of stuff by not having all these extra stages in, but at the same time, it, it, this, is, you know, this, is, this is the list. And so it's not, it's not, not necessarily obvious that, it's, that we can hide or not hide. So I'm, I'm a little wary of that. Um, of, of doing it for that, if that makes if that makes sense. So that's that's one part of the feature request, and then the other part of the feature request is to be in like a params view, and you'll notice of my parameters, I think a hundred percent of them are are read only, <laughs> um, and I could go in and filter and say read only is true or sorry uh, is false, and then I can use that and apply it, and then I have nothing. Um, let me clear that. Right, so I have to go back, clear this. So it's, it's possible to do it, but it's a little annoying. So the idea would be that you would put a, a filter button in here that would then hide or show, you know, all the, it'd be, I guess, it, I don't know if there'd be a three-way toggle, probably not. It would be read only, um, false or read all. And it would just basically just set a filter. And so from that perspective, I just said, you know what, maybe what we should do is put the filters here, um, just make them available at the bottom instead. So if I, if I actually put a little pull down that said, oh, these are the filters you have available and you could apply them, then we could make the read only filter a, a, a intrinsic, basically a built-in filter. And you could turn it on and off when you, you, when you want it on a view basis. And so instead of having a that behavior being set, it seemed to be more general to be able to say, oh, I only want to see the read write. I want to see the read write objects. It's a little bit funky. Because um, it's there's no easy view that shows you. Um, actually, there is. There's one without the view, and then there's one with the, the setting. I'm rambling. 
Does that make sense as a way to implement that feature request and why, why it's not so easy to just say, oh, I don't want to, see. oh, then there's another, there's another detail. Um, and then the other, the other thing about it is, is that from a development pattern, um, boy, we, we don't clone things when, when we're building workflows anymore. We do everything off, offline and then do it, upload them as content bundles. So when, when I'm using the UX, there's, there's very, very few times when I actually have writable content in the UX. Um, well, it, it, which, you know, for, for our patterns, that's true, but for someone who's relatively new to, to DRP and trying to build new content, uh, cloning existing content is an easy get started, uh, low barrier to entry. So yeah, um, I think the clone feature is still extremely useful for someone playing around and learning how to uh, interact with content, how to create new content and uh, take existing content and modify it for their use case for their own specific uh, implementation. Yeah. And I mean, I can, it definitely is, is annoying when you're looking at a whole bunch of stuff and you're, you're trying to figure out where my, where's my, where's that thing I'm looking for. And you've got to go through three pages of stuff. I've had that experience and that's, that's really annoying. Um, so I think the, being able to do it with the filter would make it a little bit easier um, from that perspective it would be the right, would be the right way to do it. So if you're looking, you know, if you build a filter that works for you, then you could just pull it off the list uh, and it would automatically, you get that as a filter rather than just that one behavior. Cause the other, the other thing that, that, that I was playing with that, that in looking at this uh, request, is that in a lot of cases, what I'd really like to be able to do is filter based on metadata. Uh, and so I could actually add in, uh, you know, if I'm, if I'm building my own co content, I could put a title Rob's content or title Rob. My cat's are really not loud today. Um, and then from that perspective, then when I went to look at that filter, I could only, I could filter in just all of the content that I have, which might include write, read, write, or write content, um, which would involve adding a, the ability to set to search for meta on the filters, but that's not a problem either. There, there's no ad hoc on the filters at all right now. So you mentioned something interesting to me is that you've got, I, you, maybe you're trying to overpurpose this because yeah. you really have a developer you know, track and then a, well, a teaching track too, which Shane was just mentioning is that definitely when you're trying to learn how this thing operates, you know, pulling this in is helpful. But if you're on a AI, and that's what you were saying that you did do the same thing is that when you're actually creating a bundle, it's just how close are you getting to almost doing what, you know, the whole Kubernetes and all that stuff does is that they just kind of manage everything up in, you know, a YAML data and then they pull it down and develop and then they push. Yeah, no, that's what that's what our that's what our development pattern is. Um, but at, you know, when you're in your first couple days in, in the experience, you don't you you want to clone something and play with it. Um, so yeah, but then we then you should oversimplify this, right? What do you mean? Well, just like right now, this is you know you get a lot of data, you know, <laughs> you get all these public things coming down when you're trying to learn it, right? And that's, you know, and that's what the comment was. Well, I need, I want to filter out because I know that I this works. I want to clone this and then do some development and then push, you know, then make that change. So yeah. if you're pulling, you know, if you have a development UI that's basically naked, that almost has nothing but one clone, I, you're, you know, limit the packages available. That you're getting back to the point of there's a lot of, stuff that you have there that is hard to discover, right? That's, that's the danger. That's right. Uh, and one of the things we're going to do is like, I think we're going to tighten up some of the white space in this and things like that. We're, we're doing some reviews and, and as we go through the, the UX cleanup. Um, but so, but here's my, here's my concern on, on the hiding it is that if you're, it's, it's equally frustrating to me, when I'm new in something, to be looking for some data and not being able to find it. Like if it's, if I hide, if there's something hidden that is there, then I'm like, oh, I had to click this button to, un, to unhide something. Um, 
and that I that I find frustrating also. So I mean, there's there's it's, there's going to be yin and yang on this, no matter what we do. That's why that's why I'm reluctant to do it out of the lists. So even though this list is really long, because I have a lot of stuff in my system, um, it's it would be even more confusing to see to not have something that I wanted on this list. And I would agree with that, but that's basically because you're using those things, right? I thought you were, what, what was his exact problem was, is that basically he couldn't find his unbundled stuff, right? So if he right. started off with stuff that he wasn't using and he's confused by, especially the names, because, you know, sometimes the names get reused, you know, that's just, it's a language mm -hmm. thing more than anything. But if you're, you know, this is why I went to racking in the first place. Oh, bare metal. If I know I'm building up something from bare metal, I kind of, you know, and that's where I, what attracted me is, oh, they're trying to figure out what's on that machine bare metal wise, and then we can build it up from scratch. And that this, this gets off into a very, another thing at a long discussion that I need to have with you and Shane sometime or, because that's what, you know, this is back to NVIDIA. There's a bunch of people that are trying to, you know, start to capitalize on, you know, shifting out of, because everything's getting built on demand now. You can start to shift mm -hmm. different, you know, blah, blah, blah. And I know that, Rob, I know you mentioned this a long time ago. This is back to the IoT space, you know, that anyway, I don't want to get off into that because <laughs> that's not, but uh, the, the principle is I actually think that, you know, uh, you know, like, you know, a trainer one, which is it's minimum thing. So you can see the interaction because it's, once you get it in your head, it's pretty simple, but then you can do so much too with it. This is where the, the other side of that, it gets, it, it's, it's very complex because almost everything that you ever want to do is probably already done if you find the right place, right? It yeah. just said, how do you discover that? And I don't know if that, you know, will ever work because basically, well, how many times have, uh, you know, everybody had to end up rewriting the scripts, you know, <laughs> just because Yeah, so that's exact. And and well, this, and writing the scripts is. Uh, what do you mean, scripts for testing or scripts for training? Well, both, and that's actually you know where I, when I went back to when I would I understood you know because I think it, this is in reference to that you know community thing that just went on. I can't remember who was doing it, like you were saying, but I, I understood his problem. I have the same problem when I get in because I know that it's in there, but then just getting the flow in my head so that I can deal with it. Mm -hmm. You know, it's be nice to filter that out, but instead of trying to correct it, shouldn't we just have, well, you pull down an IDE and the IDE helps you create the thing that you. Uh, yeah, we've, we're, we've been talking about having more wizards. It's um, well, no, no, it's not a wizard or anything. It's just basically the configuration you actually pull down to test with. Right. Uh, it, it's, well, I mean, I have a lot of stuff in, in, in here that's probably not, um, right, I, I guess I've got a task library, I don't know, community content and dev library. This isn't a crazy amount of content. Um, and then I don't have a lot of plugins installed, so. Yeah, but the I, one plugin you do have, which is DRP community content, that's huge, right? Uh, it's It's got a lot of stuff in it. Um, and we could talk through skinning it down. Um, yeah, I just, so, it's not as huge as you think. Go ahead, Shane. Well, yeah, I was just going to say there, there are a lot of ways to look at figuring out how to display uh, content components and a lot of ways to think about it. And I think that um, what we're all kind of putting our finger on here is there's a lot of really good, interesting stuff. And helping to make adoption and use in the early stages less overwhelming is a good thing to do. Mm -hmm. um, but there's sort of that trade-off between uh, making it simple and then dummying it down too much. So that's definitely a, a fine balance to try and walk. And a lot of that is what we're talking about here. Um, we're definitely open uh, Racken is open in terms of ideas and thoughts, which we're starting to see that feedback coming in. Chris, you have some strong thoughts and ideas as well as our um, friend and community who brought this up as well. 
um, we're open to more. If any of the rest of you have additional thoughts, we'd love to take this on. And, and we are thinking about this. And um, there are just lots of sometimes side effects to making a change, as Rob is mentioning with the initial feature request, there's some potential side effects there. Um, just sort of wrapping that conversation up and, and sort of putting a little um, placeholder in it for the moment. Um, feedback is welcome. Uh, I'm imagining that Rackend will continue to keep refining this and feedback is good in terms of helping us shape uh, our thoughts around the, the problems and issues. Um, anything else we want to um, sort of cover no, on that before I move no, over? No, I spent to... more time on it than I was expecting. Yeah, <laughs> for no worries, feature. Worries. <laughs> uh, so I think what we'll do is we're going to kick back over to pooling plugin. Greg says he's got his uh, get up going. So we'll kick back to the pooling uh, plugin and talk about that for about 15 or 20 minutes or however long Greg needs. Uh, looking forward to seeing what we've got. Greg, it's all yours if you want to take over and screen share. Greg, you're on mute just in case you're trying to talk. I'm trying to find all of those pieces. Try that. All right. So Greg, you want to just, uh, we had talked about the pooling plugin a little bit, a um, couple meetups ago. I don't remember which one um, I was looking through the archives, but I didn't see it off the top of my head, but you want to give um, our viewers for today, just a quick two minute, um, what does pooling and the pooling plugin give us generically? Yeah. So the pooling plugin gives us the ability to put uh, machines into a pool and then treat them more like, uh, ephemeral cloud resources, ask the pool for a machine, have that machine drive through a workflow, be reserved, and then you could return it back into its state in the pool. That way you, you can put a set of resources in and then pull them in and out um, versus just saying, I know about this machine, I'm gonna have it do something. It lets you drive the API as if it were asking for resources versus having to know about the resources. That makes sense. Hopefully that makes cool. sense. Yes. Okay, so the pooling plugin um, has been modified to um, use the storage system of DRP itself. So the pooling pooling plugin creates pool objects that can now be accessed in the UX. Or and CLI and API. So in this case, by default, the system starts with a pool, uh, default pool, and that's this one. And as machines come in, they're put into the default pool by, by plugging by default. So like in this case, I have a new machine. Um, the machine has some parameters that kind of allow it to helpfully um, reflect what's going on. Uh, but it's all managed through the pool plugin. So the um, indicators are the allocated, this matches the previous systems, allocated or not. So in this case, it's a member of the default pool, but it hasn't been allocated and its status is free. Oops, I didn't want to click on that. There we go. Um, and it's in the default pool. Through the normal UI uh, CLI actions, you can create pools. Like in this case, I created Jim, I could create Jill, and I'll have a plugin or a pool that doesn't have any objects in it. From there, pools have actions on them. So you can say actions. In this case, I can I see I have add machines to pool. This allows you to add the machines that are in the default pool into the um, pool, into whatever pool you specify. And you can either do that by all saying, take all the machines in default and move them in, or you can give it a list where you can specify um, specific machines you wanna move from default. And then there's a corresponding remove, which takes things out of the pool and puts it back into default. Once you have a machines in a pool, so like I can go through and say, run action, uh, Jill, 
add machines, and it'll say I have to specify a list for all. And I say all, uh, let's see. Oh, so now uh, I get a I get a list back of all the machines that were moved from the um, into the pool for Jill. By list, I can see that um, this, is, this is Jill. Um, I can see now that that machine's been added into the free. The next set of actions that we have on are for allocating and returning machines. So the idea is that I can take a machine in a pool and allocate it and put it into use. When I do that, I can pass a set of parameters that define what should happen to that machine. So I can say, put it into a workflow, add parameters, add profiles, remove profiles, remove parameters. So I can change the basic state of a machine when it goes in as I allocate it. I can even say, give me six of those. So the idea is that the pooling plugin allows us to say, you want to do something with a set of machines. You don't care which one you get. You want it to, you want five of these machines done this way. Okay. There's a flag to indicate whether you want partial success or not. So the idea is that it'll try and allocate the machines and that count and um, we'll even let you specify a filter. This matches the normal uh, machine list filter. So you can say like uh, greater than memory of one gig or whatever, right? Those kind of filtering you can do. Um, and then partial success says whether or not, say I asked for 10 and I only got five, should I continue or, or unwind that request, okay? Once um, those machines have been picked, they're updated, and then you can specify a timeout and a wait for stage. If you specify wait for stage, what'll happen is the pooling plugin will drive the system through some states to uh, indicate that it's in progress. And then um, if you specify wait for timeout, that'll cause the allocate machines to wait that many seconds for the machine to get that stage. And so what happens is if I list Jill again, so the question on that, uh, Greg, wait, wait timeout and wait for stage are kind of coupled. So if you set wait timeout, it waits for a given timeout period until wait for stage succeeds. Or That's the right. timeout. But fails. you don't have to specify, uh, if you specify wait for stage, you don't have to specify the timeout, in which case the operation becomes asynchronous and the pool status for the machine updates in the background. And that's okay. so I was gonna start explaining that. The idea is that we have things that in the free state and they're moving to the in use state. And if I specify a wait for stage, what'll happen is the pooling plugin will put it into the um, building stage, indicating that that is in process of being built. And it won't leave that stage until the um, system achieves the wait for stage or becomes unrunnable. If the system becomes unrunnable, it will be put into the build hold stage. And the idea is that as you're moving these things through the pooling plugin, the node is hopping between those states, right? And so if something errors while I'm building it, it'll go into the whole build state and that way you can see the machines and that way they're not in use but they're not able to be reserved anymore either, right? So during building, once we achieve that wait for stage, uh, once the machine achieves that stage, it gets put into the in use, okay? Um, this allows us also to keep our normal pattern of, if there's an error, we can remediate the error, mark the machine runnable, it'll move back into building, wait and waiting for that stage to um, go forward, all right, to be achieved. The timeout is merely how long should the um, requesting run action call block uh, until that stage is achieved. So that way you can treat the APA call as a synchronous and then watch the machines themselves or for the pool 
because there's pool events going on now in the background as well whenever these things change. And then also, um, or you can uh, make it blocking and say, just do this and if it fails, let me know when I can time out or get an error and those kind of things. Okay. Make sense? That's a, I mean, that, that to me, when I think about how the Terraform pool behavior used to work, that's a significant advantage because the operators in that, if, if you're doing pooling from the client side, operators have no idea if there's a whole bunch of errors and people aren't getting, getting service. It, it's all on the client to figure out what broke. So this, this basically is saying, oh, wait, if, if I wasn't able to complete the request, the operators are the ones who can help resolve that. They have the visibility now. It's a, bit, it's a nice ad. So in this case, if I don't pass anything, right, it just says put it there. And since I didn't pass a new workflow or any of those things, the machine just immediately go into the in use state. So that means that if I try and allocate again, I couldn't get enough machines to meet that allocation. So the idea is that the pool allows me to separate the identity of the machine I want and, and getting something to work on. Right? If I look at the machine, um, we'll see it's updated in use and allocated. Um, this allows the variables to be used within our normal task and profile system if you wanted to use those um, to update. These should not be manipulated by uh, normal parameter operation. The pool plugin should drive that. Um, so then the, the, the reverse of that is also true. So once a, once a machine is now in the in use state, you can um, look at the actions and there's a return machines action now. Hmm. Notice it takes the same set of parameters uh, for workflows and wait timeout and stage. And what that allows us to do is you can then say, I want to decommission something or I'm done with it, return it to the pool and put it back to the free state. That allows us to drive us through a workflow, reset parameters, and then we can also do the same blocking and non-blocking aspects and waiting for the stage to achieve. So that way I can say, run it through this decommissioning workflow and at the end, make sure I'm back in sledgehammer wait and once I achieve that, then put it back into the free state so that, that way it's available. Uh, specification of machines to return matches the same kind of uh, methodology as to add and remove machines calls do, where you can say all the machines or a specific machine list. Um, and then on top of that, um, in case machines get truly stuck or um, lost, the return machine can take a force action and you can force a machine that's stuck in any of the states that isn't free back into the free state. The idea is that, oh my gosh, I've screwed up. It's not ever going to get out of the, the loop I'm in, force it back into free and let me start over as a repooling resource, right? Um, Makes sense. Notice you can't force something into an allocated state. The idea is, Bidding into in, being in, in use is a valid condition, but because we don't make you wait and other stuff, you could actually just not specify things and drive it directly into in use. Right? So, but force is used to to get out of the whole. Let me, my machines are in a weird state. Let me force them out. But you have to specify. Things. So in this case, I can do the same. Um, run action, um, but this time if I say add machines, I can say return machines. And in this case, I get the same kind of general format of the machine's name, allocated UID and its new status. In this case, since it went straight to three, it's now updated. Now notice the UX updated in the background. That's because events are being generated for all this, including pool events. So there's, kind of this new event type that shows up called pool, just like the machine event type. And the updates are going on that as well. UX has the beginning of a view for this. So you can see in the UX I have, um, the overview has the pools listed. So like I have nothing in the default pool, one in Jill. And then um, if I do that same uh, allocate machines, 
I can see it pops over into in use. Um, UX actually shows the status of the machines while they're being moved through by changing the color and the shape of the icon so that it actually shows if it's building and not. So in that case, so you do I have a stage, a workflow? Yeah, this was sort of designed as an op for the operator to watch the pools move around, not from a user to check things out. Why is my UI not? Oh, because I'm in. Most of this is in tip. Mm -hmm. Tip UI is having a few issues right now. So let's see. Um, what down there? Uh, oh, um, as a consequence of the pool plugin, we updated and have unit tests for it now, which is a common pattern in our tests. Let's see if this works. Good plugins, yeah. So you can see in this case, it's bouncing through. You can see the the system and driving through my tests of being allocated and deallocated and driving through the system. Um, it's right now just testing the initial parts. It should switch. Mm -hmm. I have to update my unit tests for the intent feature. Um, almost. Okay, so I was doing this because I thought it would be easy to get to, but apparently not. Um, it went by so fast. Uh, oh, it's, sorry, let me switch back to the right portal. Uh, the right, yeah. Um, and run it again. But the idea is that, um, The waiting allows you to get your asynchronous operation involved as well. Assuming my UX is going to function. Uh, yeah, it's still waiting for something to happen. I don't know what's. Hmm. All right. Hey, Greg, so, I, had a, I had a question about return machine. Uh huh. So you should return machine against a pool object. Is there a return oh, machine yeah. from the machine side too? There is. Okay. Yeah, that's all. Uh, that was, I assume there was. That way an operator can say, I'm done with this machine. You don't have to know the machines when you That's make the correct. call. We'll let this go through. I got to update all that. But. Okay, one of this one. Happy. That's cool. And this really, I mean, this is one of those things where the license change allows somebody to play uh, with the pools plugin right away because we've, that's in the list. So the uh, oh, what? Oh, and my cert plugin noted, but uh, it may not match. Okay, UX is really upset right now. Apparently, don't use tip UI right now. Uh oh. Let me try it. Okay, so that's completely red wedged in my browser. Oh, snap. Um, yeah, sorry. So, um, within the, um, hmm. docs, the docs for this are in the pool plugin where all of the, um, parameters are listed and how to specify them, uh, what new parameters are available and what they mean. And then, um, like Rob was saying, the machine object has a return to pool, which will, um, take the similar set of um, parameters as the um, return to machine, 
just without the um, all or identity um, in a list parameters and return the machine back to the pool itself that way so that you can drive it from the machine's perspective. Um, there is not an allocate operation on the machine, it seems. I mean, I guess that could be added. Um, hmm. We didn't necessarily want um, just general machine matching for that. At least at the current moment. Okay. Uh, Any, anything? anything more there, Greg? I think that's it. Awesome. Thank you very much. It's a, a great run through on uh, pool plugins. And it's nice to see that we do have a lot of good documentation there. I know, Greg, you were working on that for a, a bit. So hopefully we'll see some interaction with community and get some feedback on the pool plugin usage patterns. If you are using pool plugin, uh, we'd love to know how you're using it and how it's useful for you as that helps drive use case features and uh, fixes, et cetera, et cetera. Um, I think last, before we wrap up for the rest of the day, uh, we have Sledgehammer Builder on the docket. So we don't have a whole lot we need to necessarily talk about that, but this is a big change. Uh, originally, Sledgehammer was a suite of scripts and tools that built the Sledgehammer image as a standalone thing. Uh, Racken has subsequently moved to building Racken as a workflow uh, within a DRP endpoint. So there's now a workflow built via the Sledgehammer Builder workflow that creates a uh, Sledgehammer image itself. Um, there, the changes uh, for that allow it to be um, become de decomposed a little bit and become more modular. There's still a lot of work that needs to go into to doing that. Uh, but for the most part, a lot of the tasks have been sort of broken down into small little blocks, which helps make it a little bit more uh, maintainable in general from one big, huge sort of uh, messy script. And as uh, Sledgehammer Builder evolves over time, hopefully that, get, that will get cleaned up a little bit more and a little bit more tweaked and tuned. It's also a good pattern that anyone looking to build a live boot image from might uh, base their solution off of, so you can do uh, uh, build that image, tweak, modify, and enhance that image uh, if you needed to do something custom with the image. Uh, that has been moved into the public. It was in a rack and closed repo for a while, but we got that moved into the public. Uh, that is in the digital rebar uh, provision content uh, GitHub repo, I believe. Is that correct? No, it's its own. Um... It's its own content pack at the same kind of accessibility layer as the um, community content. Yeah, it's, but it's hosted in. Oh, the, yeah, yeah, sorry. Yeah. Sorry, yeah, it's so in the, the it's provision in the content, content. Uh, GitHub repo. There's now Sledgehammer Builder, which has the boot env itself that defines uh, the actual live boot, boot environment, which is also, uh, for those of you who haven't seen it yet, is updated. Uh, to support um, multi-arch for uh, Intel and ARM-based uh, type uh, platforms. And then also um, stages, there's just the one stage, but the one stage currently has a number of uh, tasks associated with it, I think is how we broke that down. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. And so there's, you'll see here, here is a task and here is a separate task. Uh, for each of these components. So the tasks are stitched together to ultimately create the sledgehammer image. Uh, there were little hiccups with that, but I think we've gotten most things realigned uh, with sledgehammer builder from the old uh, sledgehammer build uh, solution. And uh, Rob, Greg, there anything else you, uh, Victor, I think you did a lot of the work initially to um, decompose uh, sledgehammer to sledgehammer builder. Uh, either you guys have anything you want to add into that? Now, um, TIP has the latest fixes that were divergent from the community's perspective. So um, just FYI, if you pull in TIP community content. And I think that was uh, LLDP was yeah. added in. Yeah. yeah. 
So if you're missing LLDP and the current Sledgehammer uh, version update to TIP, uh, that TIP version has been updated to include LLDPD uh, to be able to, to do the network-based uh, uh, introspection and uh, LLDP operations. Yeah, and uh, there's also more that can be done to decompose it even further, but this was just the, uh, the minimum amount of work that I had to do to get it working based off of the old uh, builder code. Exactly. Well, like, one, of the, one of the things I like about this is that if somebody's like, oh, I really need this added into Sledgehammer, you know, then you, there's a way for them to clone this and create their own version of Sledgehammer. And, and if you do that, please let, uh, let us know because that may be something useful for everybody else. It's good to get that sort of feedback. We see the same uh, patterns over and over. Um, making things better for everybody is a, a large part of the mantra at Rackham. Yeah. In digital rebar. Oh, okay. Nice. Any last comments on Sledgehammer Builder? If not, we'll wrap up uh, and we'll try and get a bug scrub in next uh, meetup and go from there. All right. Well, that's it from Digital Rebar Provision for version 32, the first uh, 2019 meetup. Thank you very much, everybody, and we look forward to seeing you again in two weeks on the 29th, Tuesday the 29th, and uh, happy January. Happy January, everybody.